Hello everybody and welcome back to the Ultimate Fashion History with me, Amanda Halley. And an episode of Fave Film Fashion. And I dedicate this one to two guys I know who love death on the Nile almost as much as I do. My husband Rupert and my brother Zach. Yes, the El Dude brother. And just to be clear, I'll be talking about the 1978 movie version here, and not the David Suchet television version from 2004, even though we enjoy that too. Oh, and speaking of David Suchet, here is a beautiful pencil portrait of David Suchet as Poirot. Look at those eyes, and it's by my brother Zach. Yes, old Jude brother. He's taking commissions, he works from photos, and he's so reasonable. I'll leave his contact details in the description. Yes, I'm shilling for everyone these days. I'll also leave my contact details in case you want to contact me directly. I don't do comments here. Or, better yet, join the Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group. There are thousands and thousands of members over there now, all of whom are as chic and intriguing as passengers on a 1930s pleasure cruise down the Nile. And that's where I'm taking you in this episode. Of course, we'll discuss the costumes and the characters in Death on the Nile, the palette, the costume details, all of that good stuff. And I'll also share with you what I've learned so far about the Kenneth Branagh version, which is supposed to come out later this year. But we are here to talk about the costumes of the all-star 1978 version. And I'll save the sumptuous evening wear for a little bit later, you know, to keep you hooked. Death on the Nile is probably one of my top 10 favorite movies. I've certainly watched it at least 10 times. And I genuinely believe that for its genre, it's pretty much as perfect as a movie can get. Directed by John Gilliman, screenplay by Anthony Schaffer, and with the sumptuous Nino Roto soundtrack, this is one classy and stylish production. And it's this movie that started my lifelong love of all things Agatha. I first saw Death on the Nile here at the ABC Cinema in Brighton when I was 12 years old, and I'd never seen an Agatha Christie adaptation before, let alone read one of her books, and I loved it. I loved it so much that as soon as we got home, I began reading my way through my mother's vast collection of Agatha Christie novels and basically read nothing else for the next three years. It drove my dad crazy. And I still love Agatha Christie, perhaps more than anyone else in the world, and I still love the 1978 version of Death on the Nile. Of course, the costumes were by Anthony Powell, and his work on the movie earned him one of his three Oscars. Now, I'm sure you all know this, but just in case, costume designer Sandy Powell, who has also won three Oscars, is his cousin. What a talented family. Anthony Powell was up against some pretty tough competition that Oscar year, and his win came as something of a surprise, as everybody assumed that fellow nominee Tony Walton was a shoo-in for his costumes for The Wiz. Interestingly, Mr. Walton had been nominated a few years earlier for his costumes for Murder on the Orient Express. Well, the Academy ultimately didn't ease on down that road and awarded the Oscar to Anthony Powell for Death on the Nile, and deservedly so, I think. And I'll explain to you as we go through the episode why I think his costumes for the movie worked so very well. But of course, we've all seen another famous movie where Anthony Powell had fun with the 1930s. He did the costumes for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and in fact... It was his idea for the opening sequence to be a fantasy Busby Berkeley musical number, which I personally think is the best part of the whole movie, to be honest. But that's another film. Let's head down the Nile. Obviously, this episode might contain spoilers. How could it not? Right, let's have some background to the movie. EMI, the studio who produced it, had enjoyed an amazing success in 1974 with their all-star format of Murder on the Orient Express and wanted to do it again with another Christie novel. But why Death on the Nile? Why not say... And then there were none. The biggest selling mystery novel of all time. It would have worked. Disparate people grouped together, stranded... 
No Place of Escape, a story that had already been committed to screen a couple of times before very successfully. Or why not another one of the 33 Poirot novels that Agatha Christie wrote? Well, I think you can all guess why Death on the Nile was the book that EMI chose. It was because of this guy. Those of you who are old enough to remember will absolutely recall that the 70s saw a second wave of Egyptomania, or more specifically, Tutmania. For it was in the 1970s that the treasures of Tutankhamun exhibition toured the world, starting in London in 1972. People lined up for hours, some even camping overnight, to get into the much-hyped exhibition. It truly was the first blockbuster museum exhibition, and believe it or not, I actually saw it. I went on a school trip all the way from Devon to London. I think school kids got fast-tracked. I hope they did, as seven-year-old Amanda did not like lining up for anything. I still don't. Here are the lines when the exhibition opened in Washington, D.C. And here's some great 70s fashion, right? It toured all around the country. Some of the host cities even painting their public buses in honor of the big event. The last and most spectacular stop on the Treasure of Tutankhamun American tour was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. They had organized the entire tour and they made sure that they ended it with a bang and rebuilt the Temple of Dendur, a gift from the Egyptian government, to give an utterly immersive experience to the exhibition. And, as you can surely guess, the American release of Death on the Nile was timed to coincide with the exhibition's opening. So tied with the Treasures of Tutankhamun exhibition was the movie that its original poster art was changed for the American market to feature Tutankhamun and it's actually quite nifty because he's holding a dagger in one of his hands and a revolver in the other. So now that we've looked at the background, let's look at the movie itself and why I think the costumes are so magnificent. Repeating the all-star cast format, Death on the Nile found legends and luminaries alongside newcomers. Peter Ustinov, Betty Davis, David Niven, Angela Lansbury, Mia Farrow, and so many others endured six weeks on location in Egypt. It could have been a horrible shoot. It was too hot to film for much of the day, so makeup calls were at 4 a.m., and and shooting went into the night. Yet it was, by all accounts, a very happy shoot, everybody friendly and getting along. And although Betty Davis, Maggie Smith and Angela Lansbury had to share a cabin on the boat as their dressing room, there were no diva antics, not even from Betty. Although she did say, In my day, they'd have built the Nile. That's my Betty Davis imitation. I'll try not to do it again. So, Anthony Powell certainly had his work cut out for him, costuming such a large cast of characters and dressing them to character. He didn't just throw everyone in a 1930s wardrobe and declare the job done. Not a bit of it. The characters in Death on the Nile don't look like actors in a 1930s period piece. They look like real people who lived in the 30s. There is such an individuality with each character's approach to style. And yet this was an ensemble cast and Powell approached palette with this in mind. Be it beige, ivory, taupe, white, cream or varying tones of brown, everybody is cast in the same color wave, which really gives the film a style all its own. When colors beyond this palette are introduced, they're soft and pastel, so they belong in the same color register, and the use of black grounds this soft light palette. Now, of course, Westerners visiting hot climes like these folk here in 1930s Alexandria did wear light colors, but a costume designer wouldn't generally go in for an entire cast wearing the same palette, as they tend to love using different colors to speak to character and narrative. Powell didn't do this. Also, given the desert backdrop, it was a bold move to put every actor in desert colors on films. and. By the way, do you see that woman in white in the middle of this image? Is it just me, or does she kind of remind you of Tony Curtis and Some Like It Hot? I digress. 
So yes, we have this desert palette for the costumes grounded with black, although there is only one other color that is used in the movie, only one bright, and you see it used popping up every scene very artfully. Red. Just pops of red here and there, as with Poirot's red bow tie here, or the red fez and cummerbunds of the Pleasure Cruise crew. The crimson red of Lynette's fingernails. The red guidebook the doctor perpetually carries around with him. That sliver of red tie here and, uh, given the movie's plotline, blood red. There's lots and lots of blood in Death on the Nile. And when it appears, it's the only red in the shot. Anthony Powell working closely with production designer Peter Merton to give the film a really unique visual style and an atmosphere born of the gestalt of palette and plot. Right, let's crack on with some fashion. We know we're on glamorous terrain when we meet our first central character, arrogant heiress Lynette Ridgway, played by the beautiful Lois Childs. In her ivory skirt suit with enamel buttons, modified Lego mutton sleeve, removable fur collar, jaunty skull cap, Powell is giving us full on golden age Hollywood glamour. Not only is he communicating Lynette's staggering wealth with her wardrobe, but he's also placing the entire movie in its period. We know we're in the 1930s, right? Dressing Lynette exclusively in a white ivory cream palette of impeccably tailored ensembles, Powell bases her wardrobe on the impossibly chic socialites of the 1930s. His attention to tailoring and detail quite remarkable. Look at that cutaway collar here with the flat shell buttons. And his detailing here really goes above and beyond what was actually necessary. As Poro would say, regardez-vous, the piping on her softly draped scarf neckline with its enamel clasp. But Powell didn't only reserve his incredible attention to detail to the wealthy passengers. Look at Lynette's maid here, Louise, played by Jane Birkin. Look at that collar, those tiny checkerboard squares as trim to the hand-stitched muslin collar. He could have easily thrown Jane into a standard 1930s maid outfit pulled from a costume warehouse somewhere, but he didn't. Soon after we meet Lynette, we meet her BFF. Jackie, played absolutely perfectly by Mia Farrow. In this shot, you can see the belt detail on Lynette's suit jacket and how the enamel belt detail is echoed by her black and white enamel necklace. But what I'd like you to focus on here is Jackie's ensemble, the printed dress and matching jacket. Although the silhouette of both of these ensembles are perfectly 1930s, the skirt length is right for 1937, the year of the book, and each silhouette is slim. With Jackie's ensemble next to Lynette's, Powell is presenting us with two central fashion ideas of the 1930s, that precise tailored look with so much attention to detail and the floating bias cut fluttery and romantic look that marked so much of the fashion decade. And speaking of details and the care that Powell put into his wardrobe for Death on the Nile, look at the print on Jackie's ensemble. The dress has a soft deco square print, but the jacket has wavy ombre stripes, which leads me to believe that the chiffon here may have been hand painted by Powell and his team. Wow. Well, we spoke about palette earlier, and I said that when a colour was introduced in this movie, it is always introduced by way of pastels. And Jackie, who is an outlier in the narrative, is dressed exclusively in pastel tones, most notably mint green. Of course, this was the perfect choice for Mio Farrow's complexion and lovely red hair and mint green, sea foam, and the lightest of corals in soft and simple tailored pieces mark her wardrobe. Anthony Powell never deviates from this palette for Jackie, and he dresses her perfectly to character as a trendy young woman who favors cool and comfortable simplicity. 
My favorite of her outfits is the one she wears at Abu Simbel, which is hard to see here, but she wears it in a later scene. It's a sleeveless white blouse with mint scarf detailing, a banded mint belt, and these enormous palazzo pants. Clearly, Powell was inspired by that 1930s Riviera look. She wears these pants again later in the movie, teamed with a tight fitting knitted short sleeve sweater in beige. And I love that Powell reused pieces of costume in this way because when we go on holiday, we don't take our entire wardrobe with us, do we? We mix and match the separates we do take to create new outfits. But while filming in Egypt, Anthony Powell had to create a truly new outfit for Mia Farrow. While on location, a new scene had been written in and Powell didn't have any wardrobe for Mia Farrow. So you see this pretty little blouse here? Powell made it from a tea towel he found in the galley of the ship, obviously drawn to it because the stripes were in the color wave he had chosen for Mia Farrow's character. It was filthy with grease and food stains, so he boiled it and boiled it, made the blouse, and it looked beautiful on screen, although evidently Mia Farrow kept saying, can you smell garlic? Let's look at another character. I invite you to pour yourself a golden what-have-you as we look at the costumes for a vamp in much need of revamping. Fallen romance novelist Salome Otterborn, as played to comic perfection by Angela Lansbury. Powell went to town with his costumes for Salome and really dressed a character with these overblown creations of brocade and embroidery and beads and tassels and so much costume jewelry that her wardrobe actually has its own soundtrack with all the jingling of bracelets and clacking of necklaces. And the genius of Powell's wardrobe for Salome is that it didn't evoke the 1930s. He could have simply put her in the kind of clothes that a woman in her 50s and the 30s would wear, but no, Salome is sartorially trapped in her glory days, the 1910s, when she was actually a successful novelist. And you can see that she has clearly been enchanted with the exoticism of Paul Poiret. She's been impressed with the sexiness of the ballet russe. No doubt she related to Thedabara as Cleopatra and thrilled to Matahari. Powell really got inside of Salome's deluded mind here, all of it culminating in this exotic eclectic mess. It's so brilliant and just for fun, Here's one of his original costume sketches for Salome Otterborn. And here's the finished product, Powell taking it a step further by giving her this very odd jeweled turban. Yet other characters are out of step with the 1930s as well, adding to the richness of wardrobe in Death on the Nile. Put upon and snarky tongued Bowers, the paid companion to Mrs. Van Schuyler and played to perfection by Maggie Smith, is another character with a mode of dress that paid no heed to fashion of the 1930s. Certainly her tuxedo stylings in the evening evoke Marlena Dietrich, particularly in the movie Morocco of 1930, a look that Bowers has seized upon, but unlike Marlena, Bowers isn't brave enough to wear her tucks with pants, favoring instead to team her masculine upper half with a skirt. And although there were nods to menswear in 30s female fashion, the decade marked a return to femininity. Yet Bowers clearly did not embrace this return, grounding her look in the daringly boyish styles of the 1920s, a look that by 1937 was really quite passé. Look at her suit here with its loose dropped waistline. It's a 1920s silhouette, 10 or even 15 years out of date for 1937, and utterly unlike the suit silhouette of the 1930s. And take a look at Bowers here 
and then look at this image from the 1920s. I think Powell might have actually used this very image for inspiration for Bowers in this scene. We learn that her character's family lost their wealth at the hands of Lynette's father, thus giving Bowers a very tenuous motive for murder, which is perhaps when she stopped following fashion. Or perhaps she just felt so at home in 1920s boyish menswear that she never gave it up. And if you need convincing any further that Bowers is trapped in the 20s, she even wears a cloche hat. The character of Bowers is a paid companion to wealthy widow Mrs. Van Schuyler, played, of course, by Betty Davis. Now, here's a story. When Anthony Powell showed up at Betty's New England home to measure her for costumes, she'd evidently baked cookies and brewed fresh coffee and then appeared stark naked, saying, This is what you have to work with. Could this be true? I like to think so. Mrs. Van Schuyler is all white lace and ankle-length gowns. Again, Powell has dressed her character and... The sarcastic Mrs. Van Schuyler is 30 years out of step with her love of Edwardian sartorial expression. Here's a photo of a pretty Edwardian girl in the first decade of the 20th century, and she could be a young Mrs. Van Schuyler, couldn't she? Look at the similarities of dress, the laced bodice with three-quarter length sleeves, the long skirt, the cartwheel hat, although Betty's is a modified cartwheel here. And this Edwardiana extends to evening wear. Here is one of Mrs. Van Schuyler's evening gowns. And look at its ampere waist. And look at that draped bodice. And then look at this museum example of an Edwardian evening gown. It's the same silhouette. And check out this gown by Lucille. It reminds me very much of the evening gowns Miss Davis wears in Death on the Nile. Before we look at Anthony Powell's brilliant use of costume contrasts and pairings, let's spend some time with the gentleman. For evening, of course, we get impeccable examples of formal black tie, but there's also some great pieces of daywear to be had. And we have to start with the man himself, Monsieur Hercule Poirot, as played by Peter Ustinov. And I like his performance here, although, of course, for most of us, there is only one Poirot. Anyway, I was really intrigued by his get-up here, but was struggling to find out more about it. So once again, I reached out to the incredible Nick at Banff Style. Do you know Banff style? Oh, it's beyond fantastic. Nick is probably one of the world's experts on menswear on film, and his website is my go-to whenever I do a fave film fashion. You will love his site, and I'll leave a link to it in the description. Sadly for me, Nick hadn't featured this particular ensemble on Banff, so I dropped him a line, and as always, he came back with the goods, telling me that what Poirot is wearing here is a version of the Victorian and Edwardian Norfolk suit. It was usually worked in heavier textiles like tweed, but made of lighter fabric here for the hot Egyptian climes. The Norfolk jacket was still worn with updated tailoring in the 1930s, but Poirot seems to favour a more Edwardian take on it. And so does Mrs. Van Schuyler, who sports a female version of it in a couple of scenes. Again, this is pure Edwardiana. Take a look at Betty's suit here, and then look at this Edwardian walking suit from about 1900 and just for fun here's Powell's original costume sketch and in the sketch he's really given Betty that pigeon breasted Edwardian silhouette hasn't he now we would not expect David Niven to be anything but suave and in his role as Colonel Race Poirot's right-hand man and confidant. He sports a beautifully cut double-breasted suit with wide notch lapels teamed with a regimental tie and a boater with a regimental hat band. Fun fact, the regimental stripes he dons in Death on the Nile belong to the regiment that Niven served in in World War II, a little costume detail that Powell included that I'm sure Mr. Niven appreciated. Here's another fun fact. During the war, Peter Ustinov was David Niven's Batman, or personal attendant, so the two sort of switched roles for Death on the Nile. 
as Colonel Ray Sniven also sports a very dapper dark blue blazer with silver buttons, which is unusual, as this sort of blazer usually has gold buttons, but the silver tones it down to blend with the movie's overarching palette. Simon McCorkendale, as Simon Doyle, sports beautifully tailored linen with straw trilbies, really lending him a Golden Age movie star vibe. Quite different to the boat managers, played by I.S. Joe Harb with his dated and quite grubby knee-length double-breasted frock coat and starched collar. And I really dig his wardrobe for handsome John Finch in the role of Ferguson, the communist wannabes with revolutionary tendencies. It's clear that for this wardrobe, Powell drew from the Spanish Civil War, and also, I'm thinking, from George Orwell, perhaps, with his crumpled, tweedy, elbow-patched suits and loose-knitted ties. I think Powell had fun with this wardrobe. Right, let's look at some evening wear. And by the way, the movie's famous tango number was choreographed by the equally famous Wayne Sleep. Anthony Powell gives us two key looks from 1930s evening wear in Death on the Nile. For the first, Powell draws directly from 1930s Hollywood for those slinky, sinuous, sensual satins and metallic tones. He looked to Adrian and Travis Banton and Ori Kelly, all the greats, as with Mia Farrow's beautiful backless silver gown here, or Lois Child's clinging gown, backless and audaciously low cut, but not too anachronistic. So many of the gowns from the 1930s were quite revealing. And the shimmering details of this one with its bias chevron tailored skirt is so similar to the one that Lois Childs wears. I wonder if it is this very gown that proved inspiration for the talented Mr. Powell. Mia Farrow's bead encrusted backless gown in soft gold tones is one of my favorites. And can we just pay some attention to the detail here? The beading on each strap is different. One strap has very little, but the other is encrusted with the most artfully arranged sequins and bugle beads. Absolutely stunning. And speaking of detail and sheer cleverness, look at Jackie's gown in the denouement scene. The paillettes are arranged to resemble snakeskin. And those of us who know the story all know why, right? Oh, and look at this gown from the movie. It reminds me so much of this museum piece from the 30s that I use a lot in class. Let me zoom in here so you can see what's going on. Gold lame with hundreds and thousands of transparent bugle beads hand sewn upon it. Some creating that banded chevron at the hip. Man, when it came to evening wear, the 1930s got it right. Any of this could be worn on the red carpet today, couldn't it? The other 1930s evening wear look that Powell plays with is this, that soft, ultra-feminine and fluttering look that the beautiful Olivia Hussey wears in her role as Salome Otterbourne's long-suffering daughter. This was another key evening look of the era, as you can see here and here, soft, with fluttering sleeves, often worked in chiffon, very feminine, very ladylike, and I think quite sexy in its own way. Although my personal favorite evening gown in Death on the Nile is the coral toned silk number that Miss Hussey wears in one of the movie's key scenes with its softly draping neckline and crystal belt feature. I absolutely love this. Apart from one or two outliers, most of the characters in Death on the Nile come in couples or pairs, and I want to briefly talk about how Anthony Powell used costume to either ally or contrast these pairs of characters. Lynette and Simon are on honeymoon, newlyweds in love, and Powell dresses them in a matching color wave, or he'll draw one color from one of their wardrobes and place it in the others, really aligning them. And look here, their evening wear is mirrored in reverse. Her black bodice, his black trousers, her white skirt, his white evening jacket. 
the masculine cut of Bauer's wardrobe contrasts strikingly with the busy, fusty lace of her employer, Mrs. Van Schuyler. Salome's overblown and multi-layered exoticism contrasts perfectly with her daughter's innocent, clean, and simplified approach to fashion, which in turn contrasts nicely with the scruffy, worldly wardrobe of her love interest. Yet either aligned or contrasting, all of the wardrobe was worked in that same distinctive Death on the Nile palette. And that includes the many extras that Anthony Powell had to clothe as well. With a wardrobe that ranged from the 30s back to the turn of the century, from the rich to the not-so-rich, from the old to the young, what makes Anthony Powell's costumes for Death on the Nile work so well for me is that, as I said at the start, this eclectic mix, united by colour, makes these actors look like real people. And I really think he deserved that Oscar. Let's talk about Kenneth Branagh's upcoming version. Well, of course, I'm interested in seeing it. Of course, we will see it. Although I have to be honest, I didn't really care for his murder on the Orient Express. But I am keeping an open mind, of course, and I'm quite excited about some of the casting. In the role of Dr. Besner, played by Jack Warden and Steve Pemberton in the 78 and 2004 versions, Russell Brand is taking that role, so that should be a lot of fun. And bringing their toxic codependency to life in the new version as Mrs. Van Schuyler and Bowers, Jennifer Saunders and Dawn French, French and Saunders respectfully, so at least we're guaranteed a few laughs in Branagh's new version. I hope you enjoyed this trip down the Nile with me. I had a blast putting this one together. All the links I've discussed in the episode, the Facebook group, my contact details, El Jude brother, Nick from Banff Style, are in the description area. I'll be back very soon with more on the ultimate fashion history. So until then, take care and thanks ever so much for watching. Bye for now.